If you've got your Bible open there to Romans chapter 8, let's begin with verse 12. We're going to read down through verse 28. And um, just there's several things that the Holy Spirit is involved with in this passage and uh, just sort of set the table for us as we get into this message. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is a, a word that indicates uh, familiarity and a tender familiarity. A little child might say, Daddy. There's that kind of, of family connection in that word Abba. The Spirit himself bears witness, verse 16, with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for that adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with it. Wait for it, pardon me, with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for uh, the gift that you have given us of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about his ministries to us today. And again, as we prayed last, last week, I, I pray that this would not simply be an academic exercise. Yes, we want to learn some things. We want to go through some things with respect to what the Holy Spirit does. But I pray that this will be uh, an opportunity for us to understand not only what he does, but how he does it and what our role is in this and how this can change our lives. So use this message not just to teach us, but to change us. And we'll be grateful for that in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, so far we've seen that there's a lot of confusion over the personality and the deity of the Holy Spirit. That there's also confusion as to his function, his work in different eras. Last week we began our look at the ministries of the Holy Spirit by thinking about the past ministries, his ministries related to creation, the fact that he inspired the word of God, uh, his ministry in the lives of Old Testament saints, which is different than his ministry to us today in some respects, and also how he functioned in the life of Christ. A lot of people don't put those thoughts together that the Holy Spirit actually ministered to Christ and served Christ and helped him in his ministry here on earth. And then we move to the present ministries of the Holy Spirit. And by present we mean in this era, starting with Pentecost up until today. And those present ministries involve caring, which uh, sometimes is referred to as common grace, where the Holy Spirit takes care of mankind. Uh, we get rain and we get sunshine and, and uh, we get the, 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 the air to breathe and the various things that the Holy Spirit is doing 
uh, and helping us with in terms of his, his general ministry to mankind. And then, more specifically to those who are, uh, that the Holy Spirit is bringing to the point of salvation, there's the ministry of calling. And then once they have trusted Christ, there's the ministry of regenerating. We might call it new life or the new birth. Of baptizing or placing us into the body of Christ. Of indwelling or coming into us and living with us and walking with us every day of our lives. Once we trust Christ as Savior. And sealing, which indicates that we are going to be God's children permanently from that point on. And you don't ask for any of those. You don't ask God to call you, and you don't by faith have God call you. You don't ask God to regenerate you, or to baptize you, or to indwell you, or to seal you. He just does it when you trust Christ as your Savior. It's part of what comes with the package of salvation. Well, this morning we want to finish up with what the Holy Spirit is doing for us today. And then we want to take a look at what He will be doing in the future during the tribulation and millennium. And let me say, I'm going to add one thing that's not in your notes at the end of what he is doing today. Because I looked at that and I thought, well, you know, that's a pretty important aspect of what the Holy Spirit does that Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be doing during our era, and it's not in your notes. And so we're going to add that at the end of that uh, first section on what the Holy Spirit is doing now. To begin with, open to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Every one of the things that we're going to talk about, except that last one that I mentioned are going to be things that are, a, that are not necessarily a part of salvation per se, but a part of our walk with the Lord after we are saved. Uh, so these have more of an impact on who we are after we have trusted Christ, not simply who we are at the moment we trust Christ. And this first one, I, 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 I'm hesitating here because I don't want to say it's the most important. It's not. They're all important. But it may be the one that's, that's, uh, that has the most bearing on us in a day-to-day -day basis. And that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter five, yeah, chapter 5, verse 18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, King James says, wherein is excess, or in which is dissipation, New King James. But, or instead... Be filled with the Spirit. Now this verse describes and defines filling for us. And it does so by way of comparison and contrast. First of all, I want you to see that this is a control issue. The filling of the Spirit is a control issue. I have never been tempted by alcohol. It's just not ever been an issue for me. For some of you it has been. Uh, I have other issues that I deal with, but that one's never been an issue. I can, I can attribute that to a couple things that happened. Uh, when I was five years old, a, a lady said, uh, you want to smell this? And she had a glass of wine and I took a sniff and almost threw up at the age of five. And so God used that in my life. And then uh, if you've never heard the story of, of my dad taking me to a Green Bay game in Milwaukee on, on the bus that left from the Alibi Bar, I'll have to tell you that story someday. And my dad kicked himself for years, and I kept telling him, Dad, you could have done nothing better for me to scare me away from alcohol than to take me on that trip. Uh, there was all kinds of beer and, and then two six-packs of Pepsi for the preacher and his kid. And uh, we were the only ones conscious besides the driver on the bus when we got back. It was a good game, I'm told. <laughs> it's a control issue. A person who is an alcoholic, a person who is given to wine, a person who gets drunk, is under the control of the alcohol. That's the reason that it is referred to as a DUI, driving under the influence. You're controlled by that substance. And the result of that is that you do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. Normally timid people become obnoxiously out front. 
Uh, people say things and do things that they don't remember and are horrified by the next day because they're under the control of alcohol. And so under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, under the control, the inspirational control of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes here, don't be drunk with wine. Don't allow yourself to be controlled by that substance. Instead, be drunk with the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I, I hesitate to say that because I don't want to defile this thought, but I want you to see the comparison. The idea here is to be completely under the control of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To where He is directing you, to where He is telling you what to say, to where He is leading you in the direction that you should go. Be under the control of the Holy Spirit. It's a control issue. And the contrast here is between flesh control and spirit control, what we just read in Romans chapter 8. There's one other thought I want to mention to you here with respect to this, because some people will say that the filling of the Holy Spirit is you getting more of the Holy Spirit. When you're saved, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and you have all of the Holy Spirit. And you have all of the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. You don't get more of the Holy Spirit on Sunday morning in church and less on Monday morning at work. You have all the Holy Spirit you're going to get, and He stays with you all the time. The amount of Holy Spirit in your life is always the same. That doesn't change. You might think it does because it sounds like you're being filled up with the Holy Spirit or not so filled with the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit makes it sound like you're getting more. That's not what's happening here. It's a control issue. The issue is how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? How much of you is he controlling? He's there. How much are you saying to God, nope, sorry, not that room? You can control every area, other area of my life, but you can't control that. I don't want you going in that room of my heart because that's mine and I like it. And it's not something that I want you to see. I want you to stay out of it. But every other area you can have. See, there's a lot of Christians who do that. This is a control issue. How much of the Holy Spirit, how much of me does the Holy Spirit have under his control? Secondly, it's a command issue. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled. In the original language, that is an imperative. Now, I want to contrast that with something else and help you to understand why we've been saying what we've been saying about things like baptism and indwelling. You are never ever in scripture commanded to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It just happens. It's not a command. You're not commanded to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It just happens. You're not commanded to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. It happens. You are commanded to be filled. This is an imperative. There is a contrast to those other things that we were talking about earlier, yet last week. With, uh, from them to this. This is a command. Now, there's a third thing I want you to see. The words be filled are in the present tense, and you could translate them continue to be filled. It's not a one time thing. You are baptized with the Holy Spirit once. It doesn't happen again. You don't get baptized with the Holy Spirit every time you reach a certain level in your Christian life. You're baptized with the Holy Spirit one time when you come into the family of God. And that brings you in. But you are to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. You are to be continually allowing the Holy Spirit to have control of your life. Because see, what happens is, we'll tell God, you can have this. And then we reach back in and grab a hold of that area and start pulling it back into our control. And we have to continually be giving things back to the, to the Lord and saying, Lord, I want you to control my life in this area. I want you to control my life. You could start every day. And it would be a good exercise to do this, honestly, from the heart, not just something that's, that's you know, uh, a rote ritual thing. But you could start every day by saying, Father, I want my life to be controlled by the Spirit of God today. 
That would be a good habit to get into. Father, I want my life to be controlled. I want to be filled with the Spirit today. I want to do what God wants me to do. So it's a continual thing. Now, how do I get filled? Some say it's through prayer, and you say, well, yeah, that's what you just said, Pastor. And yet, the Bible does not command us to pray to be filled. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't command us to do that. Nor does it furnish us examples of filling as a result of asking for it. So it's not just a matter of saying, God, fill me. Well, some would say that it's by faith that you do these things by faith. If I have enough faith, God will fill me. And yet again, that doesn't show up in Scripture. Here's how people are filled with the Holy Spirit in Scripture. They live in obedience to God's Word. And they live in obedience to God's will. And the Spirit of God fills them. One of the reasons you need to be in the Bible, I realize this is a Thompson chain and a third of this thing is notes, but that's a pretty big book. There's a lot in here. And it's God's love letter to us to say to us, this is how I want you to order your life because this is how we have fellowship. You look at all that stuff in the Old Testament and it just sounds like God saying, well, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. Boy, you know, I'm going I'm to make your life miserable. That's not what God's doing at all. He's trying to say to them, I want to break you of all of those idolatrous habits and bring you into the point that we can have fellowship. And that's what God's doing throughout this. It's bringing us back into a position of fellowship. So we need to be in God's word and studying God's word and figuring out how we're supposed to order our lives. And as we learn things, apply those things to our lives. And as you do that, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a matter of coming to God and saying, what do you want me to do? Here's what I want you to do. It's in my word. Good, I'll do it. And the Holy Spirit will fill your life. You'll be under his control. That's the concept of how you become a filled person. You obey the word of God. You obey the will of God. Now that may not be as glamorous as thinking that if you pray, you'll feel the filling of the Holy Spirit just coming up in your body. That sounds pretty glamorous. But that's not actually how it happens. God has designed the Christian life to where we get into his word, we obey what we find, and the spirit of God controls us and moves us forward in our walk with God. And then we find something else and we obey that and the spirit of God moves us forward and we are filled with the Spirit. See, a, an unbel- I mean, a, a, a new believer can be filled with the Spirit of God, even though he doesn't know what the guy who's been saved 30 years knows. He can be filled with the Spirit of God where the guy who's been saved 30 years is not. Because he's not walking with God. He knows all this stuff, but he's not obeying it. Whereas that new believer is excited and saying, boy, you know what, I don't know much, but here's what I know when I'm doing it. My life has been transformed. I'm not doing everything God wants me to do because I don't know it all yet. But I'm doing everything I know to do. And that's a person who's filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, what are the results of spirit filling? Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. Very familiar passage. And we talked about it. Uh, Warren just mentioned it. We talked about it this weekend in this whole marriage thing. And what they did is tie this fruit of the Spirit passage to the love passage in 1 Corinthians 13. It was a fascinating back and forth study. It's really neat to see. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. One of the results of spirit filling is the fruit of the spirit, or or as I put it in my notes here, Christ-likeness. Another is praise. We just read uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Go back to Ephesians again and look at chapter 5 and look at the verses that follow that. 
filled with the Spirit, verse 18, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have this instant focus on praise. The filling of the Holy Spirit is going to naturally lead you to praise God. And then there's another one. You see service off to the side. I'll mention that in just a second. There's another one, the very next verse, in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. There is submission as a result of the, the, the filling of the Spirit. And what happens when you put those together is that people start saying, I want to serve God. I want to be involved in the work that God is doing. I want to be part of this because my life is Christ-like and I'm honoring God with my, my, uh, my mouth and I'm in submission to, it, to him and to one another and I want to serve. I want to be involved. Most people who put those three together are not going to leave the one on the right out. They're not just going to sit there and soak. They're going to say, God, I got to get involved. I got to be a part of this. I want this to be part of my life. The filling of the Holy Spirit is an important aspect of, of what the Holy Spirit does for us and what our Christian lives ought to look like. That's why we spent some extra time on it this morning. Now, that doesn't diminish the rest of what we're saying here. It just says that, that this is critical. It's key if you're going to walk with God. Back to John chapter 16 for our second point here. The second of these is teaching, which according to John chapter 14, 15, and 16 is a primary task of the Holy Spirit according to the Lord Jesus. In chapter 15 and verse 26, he says, But when the Helper, that is the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He's going to teach us about Christ. He's going to teach us who Christ is and what Christ is doing and what Christ has done and how, what difference that makes in our lives. He'll testify of me. He'll honor Christ in our... You know, one of the things that's interesting to me about the ministry of the Holy Spirit is it's so focused on Christ. His ministry, his purpose is to teach us about Christ. is to bring us into Christ-likeness. To exalt the Savior in our minds. But there's a second one, and it's in chapter 16 and verse 13. It's broader. Verse 13 says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said he will take of mine and declare it to you. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to take what the Lord Jesus has started and expand it into our lives. Some people say, in fact, this was one of the statements of uh, Thomas Jefferson, that he really liked the Gospels because those are the words of Christ and he really didn't care much for the epistles. Whoa, 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 wait. <laughs> wait a second. Just because it's in red doesn't make it more of the Word of God. It's the Word of God because it's written by the Holy Spirit of God. What Paul wrote, what Paul penned, came from the heart and mind of the Holy Spirit of God. So don't diminish Ephesians and exalt Matthew. Amen. Matthew is critically important. John is critically important. So is Romans. So is Hebrews. So is Revelation. And not, one is not above the other. They are all the Word of God. So the ministry of the Spirit is to do that for us. We won't take the time to look at it, but if you, turn to, if you were to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it talks about the Holy Spirit is illumining um, the Scriptures to the mind of the child of God and noting that there's a difference between the person who does not know Christ and the person who does know Christ. So the person who does not know Christ, even though that person may be a a fairly young child of God can grasp Scripture in a way that the person who doesn't know Christ just can't get. And there are brilliant people out there who don't get the simple things of the gospel. 
because the Holy Spirit hasn't opened their minds to it. Whereas there are four-year-old children who get it because the Holy Spirit is their teacher. So we have a teacher. Third, we have a guide. Romans chapter 8, where we read earlier, if you go back to that, verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you're a child of God, you have a guide. You have a leader. You have someone you can follow. And that person is the Holy Spirit. <coughs> there are hymns that are written to that effect. He leadeth me comes to mind. Uh, oh, words with heavenly comfort. Whatever I do, wherever I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We don't walk this path alone. We don't. We have... We have <laughs> We talk about his ministry of guiding, and part of the reason he can do that is because he indwells us. Amen. We have the Holy Spirit with us all the time, and he just walks the path with us. Staying right there in Romans chapter 8 and looking at verse 16, we also have the ministry of assurance. You've probably heard, and maybe you've said, Christians, you probably heard Christians say this, and maybe you've been one who said it. I'm not sure I'm really a Christian. I don't know whether I really am a Christian or am not a Christian. I don't know whether that's true. Well, how do you know you're saved? Because lack of assurance is not uncommon, especially among new believers, but even among older believers. The key to assurance is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Bears witness of what? that we are the children of God. So there is a corresponding witness between the Holy Spirit of God and the spirit of the child of God. And that corresponding witness is the Holy Spirit saying, you belong to me. Amen. You are my child. I've placed you into this family, into the body of Christ. I've given you new life. I've sealed you and secured you into the family. I'm living in you right now, and I will never leave you. And that's the Holy Spirit of God witnessing to your spirit. Now, there's some other indicators that you're a child of God. You love to be in the book. You want to be around God's people. You want to serve the Lord. Those are indicators that you're a child of God. But according to what Paul's writing here in Romans chapter 18, one of the key indicators is that you have this resonance with the Spirit of God. There's a back and forth flow between you and the Spirit of God. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that these things are, you're hearing them audibly come into your ear. It's spirit to spirit. It's one person to another. And that's one of the points of the assurance of the Spirit. One of the ministries of the Spirit is assurance. Stay in Romans 8 and go down to verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts, verse 27, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now standard interpretation of this verse is that we pray... The Spirit of God steps in and cleans up the mess and presents something that, that is more acceptable to the Father. That's not wrong. There's just a component missing in it. The Spirit is not just taking the prayer that we make and, present, and fixing it and presenting it to the Father. The Spirit is teaching us to pray. Amen. Do you see that in, this, in verse 26? Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. His ministry of intercession involves the process of placing the prayers we offer to God on our hearts and then presenting those prayers to the Father. Now, because of our sinful condition, we talked about this a little bit at our, at our state meetings. Because of our sinful condition, we often don't even know what to ask for. Because we think of things from a, um, from a human perspective, from a sinful perspective, from, from a fleshly perspective. Sometimes we don't know how to approach a request that we want to submit. Let me give you a for instance. 
You're faced with a financial shortfall. Significant. And you have creditors that want their money. So you come to God. Father, I have a bill due. I need the money. Yesterday. There are people knocking at the door looking to get paid and I don't have it. Now may not be soon enough. But God's answer may not be to drop it in your lap before you're done speaking. Now it might be. Sometimes it is. Sometimes God's answer is different. Sometimes God's answer is, I'm going to wait until the last second because I want you to know that this came from me, not you. This came from me, not your neighbor down the street. This came from me. I want you to see that this will happen. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, at the very moment I needed it, and not a moment sooner, at the very moment I needed it, I got exactly what I needed. Sometimes to the penny. You watch that, you see, see, you see God supply and you think, well, that's pretty cool. Sometimes God supplies more than we need. Oh, that's neat. And then you realize that what he supplied over was for something else that's coming down the pike that you didn't know about. Sometimes he doesn't supply it. What's God saying? Maybe God's saying we need to reorder our priorities. Maybe there's something in our life that we're paying money for that we shouldn't be paying money for. We need to get that out of our lives. It's taking up too much time or it's taking up, it's pulling us away from him. And he wants us to learn not to have that thing. And so there's a number of different things that God could be doing in his answer to that prayer that is not just dropping the money in your lap right now as soon as I pray it. The Holy Spirit will help us with that. It's part of his work to pray for the right things in the right way. And then part of it is helping us to present those still imperfect prayers to our Father who loves us so much. <clears throat> the next one, which we're not going to take a lot of time on because time's almost gone, and because we're going to get into it in a separate message, is the issue of gifting in Romans chapter 12. And in 1 Corinthians 12 and in other places, we talk about the, the, the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, there are several things I want to just mention briefly, but we're going to look at it in more detail, so we'll just mention these briefly. Every believer is gifted by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, and also verse 11. The Holy Spirit gives gifts as he sees fit. You don't go in and say, you know what, I think I'd like the gift of being president of a college. Well, that's not one of them to begin with. And number two, he may not want you to do that. So he gives gifts as he sees fit, not as you see fit. Third, the spiritual gifts are supernatural abilities God gives to believers. There is no gift of playing the flute. Sorry, Erica. It's a wonderful talent. I'm glad you have it. Glad you use it. There's a spiritual gift in connection with using it, but that's not the gift of learning to play an instrument is not that. The gift of being a speaker. There's a lot of great speakers who don't know Christ. One of the greatest speakers in the history of mankind was Hitler. Didn't know Christ. Wasn't a spiritual gift. Great natural ability, not a spiritual gift. You can connect the two, and you should connect the two, but it's not necessarily, uh, they aren't necessarily that way. So spiritual gifts are supernatural abilities. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. The gifts are given to individual Christians so that they may minister in and to the body of Christ. Romans 12, 5. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. And not every gift was intended to be given to every man or every woman or in every generation. Some of the gifts were for, for specific purposes early in the church and are not given today. So that's some of the thoughts with respect to gifting. We'll get into that more later. Um, but I just wanted to mention that to you. And then the one that's not in your notes is convicting. And that's John chapter 16, verses 8 to 10. Um, Jesus said that when he sent the Son, uh, sent the Spirit to us, that he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, of, and of judgment. And then he goes on to elaborate on that. Those actually seem to be directed more toward the world than toward us, although convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to be a part of our lives as well. But that passage that Jesus is talking about says he's going to convict the world. Not just the believer, but the world. So it seems to be, at, at the very least, an overall thing, and it may be even the kind of thing where the Holy Spirit is convicting those who are unsaved. So uh, that part of the text is there as well. All right, that's, that's the, uh, the present ministry of the Holy Spirit. One of them is to all of mankind, maybe two. 
Uh, quite a number of them, all the rest of them, if you will, are directed toward believers, some at the beginning of our walk with God, some throughout the course of our walk with God. And the Holy Spirit is very active. And I'll tell you, when you start looking through these 12 things, 13 things, especially the ones that are directly um, focused on those of us who are Christians, what the Holy Spirit does for us is phenomenal. Amen. It is phenomenal. And we neglect that and ignore it to our peril. Not our peril. It's not right the way, not the right way to say that because we're going to heaven. But we neglect that um, to our disadvantage. We are, we are hurt and pained spiritually as believers when we do not uh, follow the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and walk in His, uh, in his light. All right, one other thing I want to mention uh, this morning, and we'll do this briefly. There's not a lot on it anyway. And that has to do with the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the future. Very little information on this subject in the Bible. Virtually nothing on his ministry in eternity. We don't know anything about that. But we do know he'll be active in the tribulation and in the millennium. We know those things primarily from Old Testament passages. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, we find out that, which is speaking to the tribulation, we find out that God will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So the Holy Spirit of God will be in, in, the, process, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the business, I should say, of bringing people to Christ and helping them pray, kind of like he does today. So that will be involved in the, during the, the uh, uh, tribulation period, and that is a passage that's primarily directed toward Jews. And then in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, again, a passage that's primarily focused on his ministry to Jews during the tribulation. Um, speaks of the tribulation period, a time when the Spirit's no longer indwelling every believer, but appears to be working with believers as he did in Old Testament times, selectively empowering. And as the tribulation draws to a close, he'll become very active in the hearts and minds of Jewish believers, empowering them uh, and drawing many of them to their Messiah. During the millennium in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, um, he will be in the process of bringing people to Christ. And uh, according to Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, uh, it seems that, that he will be indwelling people as he does here in, in our era. They say, well, how can he be bringing people to Christ? Uh, didn't everybody who goes into the millennium, aren't they all saved? Yes. No ungodly people are going into the millennium. Right. However, people will be birthed, will give, be given birth, will be born during the millennium. Those people will need to come to Christ. They'll need to, be, they'll need to believe and by grace through faith come to Christ as their Savior. Can I say something that, that some people don't get? It doesn't make any difference when you live. Salvation is always by grace through faith. Amen. Always. Always has been. Always will be. It's always the grace of God. It's always on, uh, through the agency of faith. And it will be during the millennial period of time as well for those who are born that, during that period. And not everybody will exercise faith and be saved because Satan will be re released at the end of the millennium and he'll have a whole bunch of people who follow him. Won't be anybody who follows him who came into the millennium, but there'll be a lot who are born. It's a thousand year period of time. There'll be a lot of people born. Uh, a lot of folks who will be born during the millennium who will turn away from Christ and will follow Satan at the end. So the Holy Spirit will have that kind of ministry of uh, bringing people to Christ during the millennium as well. well. What a tremendous gift the Spirit of God is. So what's your response to God's very personal and valuable gift? Have you trusted Christ in response to the Spirit's convicting and calling work? Have you yielded control of your life? Is he a teacher you listen to? And learn from? Is he a guide you follow? Is he a trusted partner in prayer? Do you know how he has gifted you and are you using those gifts? Do you respond to the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of God is here to help us be all we can be. See that army slogan? It's an old one now. They don't even use it anymore. But be all you can be. Well, the Holy Spirit of God is here so you can be all you can be as a child of God. He wants to mold each of us into successful Christians. All we need to do is yield to follow his will and obey.